Okay, so thank you for inviting us here today. Uh, my name is Ann Bacalas, and I'm with the Posi Supercomputing Research Center, and I'm joined by Aditi, who's on the camera, and by Dr. Celie Richardson, who is from the University of Western Australia. It's a Posi tradition to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting, and that is the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and we pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. So today, uh, as I mentioned, I'm from the Posi Supercomputing Research Center, and uh, the sleep survey that you are doing is um, been created and is hosted on the POSI site. So POSI also has a new supercomputer. It's called Satonix. And does anybody know what Satonix means? Yes? Quokka, that's right. And you'll see that we have lots of quokkas here for you today that you can have on your way out. We're excited about Satonix because once fully deployed, and that's mid next year or so, Satonix will be the most powerful supercomputer, not only in Australia, but also in the Southern Hemisphere. And we're very excited about that because that means that our scientists and researchers who use our supercomputer we'll be able to do much bigger and greater and grander things, um, working in such things as COVID, climate change, et cetera, so answering those big science questions. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Seely Richardson from UWA. Thanks. So my name is Dr. Seely Richardson. I'm a lecturer and a clinical psychologist at the University of Western Australia. Um, my general area of expertise is adolescent sleep and mental health. And so today I'm going to talk to you about sleep in young people. And hopefully this will nicely complement what you've been learning about in class already. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself and how I became an expert in an adolescent sleep and mental health. When I was sort of at your stage, I was thinking I might be interested in being a psychologist. And so once I finished high school, I went to university and did a bachelor's degree in psychology. And that gives you lots of exposure to different areas of psychology. I was lucky enough in my third year of university to do a whole unit just on sleep. And that's when I became fascinated in sleep. Up until that point, I really enjoyed psychology, but I love biology as well. And I found that the area of sleep perfectly kind of married those two areas together. Um, so I went on and did my honors, which is a year long research project in sleep. Love that even more. Um, and continued on and did a PhD in clinical psychology. So I still wanted to be a psychologist, but I really love research. And so I did a big four year research project in adolescent sleep and did my training to become a clinical psychologist at the same time. Uh, once I finished that in 2018, I moved from Adelaide over to Sydney and I worked as a researcher for about a year and a half. Um, on that project, I was looking at identifying risk and protective factors for the development of mental health problems in young people. And sleep is one of uh, the main kind of risk factors for mental health problems in young people. Um, and right before COVID kicked off in 2019, uh, end of 2019, I came over to Perth and I'm now working as a lecturer at UWA. So I spend half of my time teaching at the university level and half of my time doing research. And I'll tell you a bit about my research today as well. So I'm going to start off by providing a bit of background um, about sleeping young people. I'll then introduce you to uh, some of the research that I've done in this area and we'll end by talking about risk and protective factors for adolescent sleep. So I'm going to start with a bit of a quiz. So um, do you think it's normal to awaken during the night about every 60 to 90 minutes? If you think it's normal, maybe put your hand up. Not too many people. <coughs> Who thinks it's not normal to wake up during the night? Yeah, most people. Yeah. So how much sleep do you think adolescents actually need? How many hours? Yeah. Eight to 10 hours maybe. Does anyone else think something different? It's what, sorry? Eight to 12. Eight to 12? Yep. I'll move to the next question. So true or false, Australian adolescents get more than eight hours of sleep on school nights. If you think that's true, put your hands up. Do you think adolescents get more than eight hours? Who thinks it's false? Who thinks you get less sleep? Okay. So I'll answer these questions um, when I go through the background section now. Um, so to start off with, I'll introduce you to two processes that determine when we're asleep and when we're awake during the day. Um, so these two uh, processes have kind of complicated names. The first one is sleep homeostasis and the second is a circadian system. 
And the reason it's important to understand these two processes is that as a psychologist, when we treat sleep problems, behavioural sleep interventions primarily target those two processes. So the first process, sleep homeostasis, um, like I said, it's a bit of a complicated word. You can call it process S. Um, it's essentially how we build up sleepiness um, and dissipate sleepiness um, across the day. So it's much like our hunger drive. If you go without food, the longer you go without food, the hungrier you get. You'll start craving food, thinking about food until you eat food. Um, well, sleep homeostasis works in the same way in that from when you wake up across your waking hours, you um, keep on building up sleepiness across the day until it reaches sort of a saturation point around your normal bedtime. That's when you start to feel sleepy. And that um, feeling of sleepiness helps you to fall asleep quickly and stay asleep across the night. So that's what the figures sort of showing how you build up sleepiness, you fall asleep and the sleepiness is reduced um, across sleep. In the dotted line on the figure, what you can see is an example of when you nap during the day. So you might feel kind of sleepy and you might maybe nap for a couple of hours. Uh, this person's napped at about 6 p.m. But you can see that that's reduced their sleepiness because they've napped. Once they've woken up, they start to build up sleep pressure again. Um, but you can see when it comes to their bedtime, they have nowhere near the amount of sleep pressure that they need. And this is why sometimes when you nap in the day, it can be really hard to fall asleep at night. Um, in the pink line, what we have is an example of what would happen if you went without sleep for a whole night. So you would keep building up sleepiness, um, and that would reach sort of a saturation point. You'd probably find it really hard to keep your eyes open, you might even feel like you're having some micro sleeps. Um, but then uh, when you do eventually get to sleep, you can see that you dissipate that sleep pressure or pay off that sleep debt um, almost at the same rate. So you end up around the same point as someone who has had a full night of sleep the night before. And so this, um, this indicates that perhaps you don't need to make up sleep hour for hour. Uh, we have some flexibility in our sleep system that we can increase the depth of our sleep to make up for sleep loss. So what do I mean by... Uh, depth of sleep. Basically, we have different stages of sleep across the night. So you uh, would have lighter stages of sleep, a more medium kind of intermediate stage of sleep, and then you have deep sleep as well. Um, this is indicated from light sleep in the yellow, more of the intermediate stage two sleep in green, and then the deep sleep is in blue. So if we were to ask someone on the street, what do you think your sleep looks like across the night? They would draw a line something like this. So this looks a bit like a deep valley of unconsciousness. Um, generally, people think that you fall asleep, you might be in a light stage of sleep for a bit, um, and then you spend most of the night in deep sleep. It's not normal to wake up, you should stay in that deep sleep. And then just before it's time to wake up, you would go back into light stages of sleep again. But that's not what our sleep is like at all. So our sleep is more like a roller coaster. It's much more like this figure. So you're constantly cycling through light stages of sleep into deep sleep. You spend a bit of time in deep sleep, but you go back into a light stage of sleep again. And then you might get um, in red, this is our REM sleep, where we have a lot of our um, dreams. So you have some dreaming sleep, but then you go back into another sleep cycle again. So you keep going through these cycles. Um, you would have REM sleep, and then it's normal to wake up out of that sort of light stages of sleep or, or your REM sleep. And you keep going through these sleep cycles, but what you can see is that most of your deep sleep you get at the start of the night. So in the latter half of the night, you're spending most of the time in a lighter stages of sleep. And it's, more, it's easier to wake up out of um, those sleep because the sleep cycles are much shallower. Developmentally, uh, what happens during adolescence is that adolescents can cope with being awake for longer. I guess kids build up sleepiness and kind of need to um, go to sleep, but adolescents get better at dealing with being awake for longer. So it takes longer to kind of build up that sleep pressure before you go to sleep. And this is why sleep onset difficulties can sometimes um, develop in adolescence. So teens might have difficulty falling asleep. They might spend a long time awake at the start of the night. Um, and from childhood to adolescence, you generally spend less time in deep sleep across the night as well. So the next process is the circadian system. It's just a fancy way of uh, referring to the body clock. So when we're talking about the body clock from a sleep perspective, there are two things that we look at. We look at melatonin and your core body temperature rhythm. Has anyone heard of melatonin before? A few people? Uh, so hopefully you know that's our sort of sleepiness hormone. It's a hormone that helps us to feel sleepy. So it's basically non-existent in our bodies during the day um, when we're exposed to light. But in the evening, uh, when our eyes are exposed to darkness, this is when our body starts to produce melatonin and that's what helps us to feel sleepy. Partly the way that it does that is it 
um, causes a drop in our internal core body temperature rhythm. And it's that slight drop in our internal temperature that helps us to feel sleepy, helps us to fall asleep and stay asleep across the night. And so as we wake up um, towards the morning, you're sort of exposed to light, our melatonin will shut down and then our core body temperature will increase. And that increase in our temperature is what helps us to feel more alert and awake. But you'll see that you don't just feel 100% alert throughout the day. It can take a while, even up to sort of about midday, to hit that peak in your temperature and to feel the most alert. There's also this um, dip in our temperature in the afternoon, normally around 3, 3.30. And this dip in temperature can cause us to feel sleepy. So if anyone does nap, I guess you might finish school, you might feel pretty sleepy. And that might be one of the reasons why you feel sleepy at that time, because you have a little dip in your core body temperature rhythm. So what happens in adolescence? Again, there's some really interesting developmental changes that happen. So from childhood to adolescence, your body clock drifts later. Um, normally by a couple of hours. So the time that your body's producing melatonin and your rhythm, your internal core body temperature rhythm will drift later by a few hours. And that means that you generally don't feel ready to go to sleep until much later compared to when you were a child. Um, but because you've got school the next day, a lot of young people still go to bed at the same time. But this causes um, difficulty falling asleep. So it might take you a while to fall asleep. But school start times don't change, so you still need to get up early in the morning, and that can lead to uh, reduced sleep duration on school nights. So then what we see in young people is that when it comes to the weekend, we see that adolescents typically go to bed later and they sleep in. Partly that's because it better aligns with your body clock timing, but partly that's because you're also making up for sleep that you've lost during the school week. So there's this sort of perfect storm of factors that mean that adolescents are particularly at risk of sleep problems. As I've said, there are these changes to our internal kind of biology that mean you're more at risk of sleep problems, but there are also psychosocial pressures as well. So generally from going um, from childhood into adolescence, you have more autonomy over things. And so one um, of the primary things that adolescents can decide is perhaps what time they go to bed. And this can mean that adolescents are choosing to go to bed later. Um, but you also have more study and homework that you need to do and you might sacrifice sleep to be able to fit that in in the afternoon, in, in the evening and afternoon. Um, you also might uh, use screens or technology a lot in the evening and you also want to kind of be hanging out with your friends and talking to your friends and all of these things can further kind of um, encroach on your sleep. But like I said, school starts um, early and so this means from childhood to adolescence you typically go to bed later and you get less sleep. So how much sleep do teens get around the world? Um, well, this data came from a meta-analysis. Uh, a meta-analysis involves getting all of the studies that have been done on a particular area and pooling the data together. And this study showed that in Australia, adolescents on school nights are getting about 7.92 hours of sleep. This is um, uh, not as good as the adolescents who are over in Europe who get about 8.44 hours, um, but it is better than uh, young people in Asian countries who get about 7.64 hours of sleep. And then the worst kind of um, sleeping adolescents are over in America, they get about 7.46 hours. So culturally, um, adolescents in Asian countries have a high pressure to perform academically, and so they tend to sacrifice sleep to be able to perform well at school. And then the reason why the American adolescents get the least sleep is because their school starts about an hour earlier than it does here. So they would have to be at school by about 7.30 and they might even have commitments before school as well. So some of the researchers over in the US have really been advocating for schools to start later and that seems to be having a really good impact on their sleep and a whole range of other things as well. Okay, so how much sleep should you be getting? Well, this is a schematic from the National Sleep Foundation that shows across the whole lifespan how much sleep is recommended. And you can see for teenagers between 14 to 17 years, it's recommended that you get between eight to 10 hours of sleep each night. But there is a huge amount of individual difference there. We all need a different amount of sleep. So it might be okay for some young people to get seven hours of sleep and there are other young people who need much more sleep and they might need say 11 hours. But for most adolescents, it's recommended to get between eight to 10 hours of sleep. So you can see that average school, um, school night sleep duration in uh, Australian teenagers is below that recommendation. So what are the consequences of not getting enough sleep? In terms of the psychosocial domain, uh, not getting enough sleep can uh, 
increase your risk of experiencing mental health problems like depression and anxiety, but you can also have trouble uh, socially, so it might be harder to make and keep friends, and this leads to decreased life satisfaction overall. Um, in terms of physical health, if you're not sleeping well, you tend to not have as healthy a diet and you tend to exercise less, which can lead to increased risk for obesity, cardiovascular disease and pain. Another key element is school performance. And so sleep seems to be robustly related to academic outcomes. This could be because it's impacting your cognitive functioning, but it could also be that if you have a sleep problem, it's just harder to actually attend school. You might be late to school and missing out on key classes. And then finally, um, inadequate sleep is also listed to increases in risky behavior. So things like substance use, sleepy driving um, and aggression and risky sexual behaviors as well. So I'll now move on to the second element. So I'll tell you a little bit about my research that I've done. Um, so my PhD was looking at delayed sleep wake phase disorder, which is a body clock sleep problem where your body clock is timed so late that you find it hard to fall asleep when you want to and really hard to wake up to get to school or work. Uh, about 1.1 to 8 0.4% of adolescents in school are thought to have this particular sleep problem, um, meeting all of the diagnostic criteria, but about half of um, adolescents at school meet at least one of the diagnostic criteria. So in this study, I had 60 adolescents and young adults enrolled um, in a treatment trial, and we delivered bright light therapy, which is a treatment for this sleep problem. The reason that we use bright light therapy is because light is the primary time giver for our body clock. So depending when we are exposed to light, we can even move our body clock earlier or later. So in this treatment, what we do is we get adolescents to sleep in on the first morning of treatment, and then they, uh, they expose their eyes to bright light through these kind of futuristic looking bright light glasses that I've brought with me today. Um, and then uh, what you do is they wake up earlier by half an hour and get the bright light half an hour earlier each day. And this has the effect of moving the body clock earlier over time so that uh, they can fall asleep earlier, um, get more sleep across the night and hopefully wake up feeling more refreshed. And so the way that you used to get bright light would be through a light lamp or a light box, but they've developed these glasses recently. One reason they're good is because you can wear them and walk around with them on. The other reason that they're good is that they deliver short wavelength of light and short wavelength of light looks blue or green. So you might've heard before that blue light is particularly harmful for sleep. And that's because it moves your body clock better than say red or orange light. So what I aim to do was to compare the efficacy of this sort of blue-green glasses with the red glasses. And what I found was that adolescents uh, fell asleep earlier and wake up earlier after receiving treatment. They fell asleep quicker on school nights, they slept for longer, and they reported being less sleepy, fatigued, and impaired. But interestingly, there wasn't any difference between the red glasses or the blue-green glasses. I was also interested in the effect um, on cognitive performance. So we looked at working memory and processing speed. So working memory you could think of as our mental workspace. So this is where we store information temporarily and um, use that information. So it's really important for following spoken instructions and mental arithmetic. Um, and we also looked at processing speed, which is how quickly you can respond and process information. That's really important for reading, um, listening and taking notes. And treatment also improved working memory and processing speed. So I'll move on to the final section of the talk, which is about risk and protective factors for adolescent sleep. Again, this data came from a meta-analysis where you pull all of the studies that have been done um, together in one area. And the factors highlighted in red are the risk factors that came out of this study and the factors that are protective factors or promote good sleep are in green. So you can see risk factors for not getting enough sleep um, are substance use, so tobacco use and caffeine use, um, having a negative family environment, so having um, been in a family home where you don't feel safe, um, and also using the computer and being exposed to evening light. But the protective factors for adolescent sleep are having good sleep hygiene, so having a good sleep routine, um, having a dark, quiet um, and safe uh, bedroom environment, not ingesting caffeine and things like that. And um, the other important protective factor was having a parent set bedtime. So if you have a parent who's telling you when to go to bed, that's actually a really good thing and you're more likely to get good sleep. 
What you can probably see in the middle, so these factors in the middle weren't really reliably related to adolescent sleep duration. So you can see phone use, internet use, video gaming and television didn't have a huge impact on the amount of sleep that teenagers were getting. Um, and this shows you that maybe it depends on the type of device, um, the effect that technology use has on sleep. Um, but it also varies depending upon what sleep variable you're looking at, whether you're looking at what time you go to bed or how much sleep you're getting. So the relationship between sleep and technology use isn't really a simple one. Um, I guess what you hear is that technology use is bad, but it's not that simple really. Um, so not only can the use of technology impact your sleep, but it can go the other way around as well. So if you are not sleeping very well, it might actually influence how you use technology. And this is something that we wanted to investigate through the Risk to Adolescent Wellbeing project that I am part of. Um, we looked at the bi-directionality, so what is sort of causing what, and the other uh, thing that we wanted to look at is if you have a parent who has rules around how you use technology, um, does that protect your sleep? And the findings were quite interesting. So um, what we found was that if you spent more time using technology, a year later you had less sleep and you reported being more sleepy. But sleep also seemed to affect your technology use. So if you're someone who's a bit of a night owl, then you are more likely to increase your technology use one year later. And if you didn't sleep uh, that much one year, you're actually going to increase your technology use a year later as well. So the relationship goes in both directions. And possibly I'm wondering whether if you have sleep problems as a teenager, maybe you're using technology to kind of cope with that sleep problem. In terms of parental control though, um, whether or not parents had rules around tech use that had no impact on how much their teenagers were actually using technology and it had no impact on their sleep either, which was really interesting. Um, so I've come to the end of the talk. Hopefully you've learnt something. Um, so the main take home points are that adolescents are particularly vulnerable to experiencing sleep problems and inadequate sleep negatively impacts almost every aspect of our functioning. But we do have effective psychological treatments for sleep problems in young people. And hopefully now you realise that the relationship between sleep and technology use is more complex than we generally believe.